Hello there, viewers. This is your host, the Cassette Master. This video comes to you from the productions of Tripod Haters International. If any of you have ever seen the movie Office Space with the scene where the people go out to destroy the printer, picture instead my camera's tripod being in place of said printer. That is about how I feel towards my tripod. I want the thing destroyed. In this video, we will be showing to you a very special Soviet cassette tape recorder, the Topaz D202 from 1985. You see the purse looking thing I'm holding up? Yes, picture me carrying this around like a purse. This is the nice case containing the Topaz D202 dictation recorder. It's a very unique machine, not only in its odd mechanical design, but also in the fact that it runs only at a single speed of 2.4 centimeters per second, or 15 16 inches per second, which is half of the standard speed of a cassette tape. So, if you play recordings made by this machine on a regular tape player, you will be greeted by... Alvin, the chief amongst several chickmunks. You can see it has a very... Let's talk normally. You can see it has a very nice um, carrying case. May have a nice, durable-feeling material. You can see the machine inside... Take a gander over at the top and see the clipping latch to hold the case cover. Sorry, I clipped the audio. This is going to sound terrible. So, you can see the very nice case with cutouts for the speaker, cutouts for the buttons, and the cutouts for the cassette door, which you can open up. It does need a little bit of help, though. Don't you dare. So the time has happened. Time has come. The time for everything. There's a time for everything. What and how? Oh my gosh, the tape is catching on that thing? Are you kidding me? Holy crap. Here we have the machine down where we can slide it out of the case. Here, we have the microphone slash control for play, stop, and record, and roll back. Here's the front of the microphone assembly, and there is a condenser microphone in the top. One might wonder what this little hole is, and it's only on one side. It's a tiny little speaker. So if you want, you can play back the sound through the microphone, although it's not through the microphone itself. It's through a separate speaker, a tiny, tiny speaker inside. Obviously, condenser microphones can't play sound. Now let's take the machine out of the case. Here's the recorder. It's a very neat recorder. Apologize for positioning of things. But, hey, you get to see how my videos are. Ha, huh, am I right? Yeah, camera work that sucks, uh, this and that that sucks, a whole lot of crap. Okay, so anyway, yeah, I have a low. When I'm making a video, I start just letting these bad opinions come out. Okay, so a very interesting recorder. Let's take some close-ups of this recorder. Now, perhaps Russian viewers could help me with this one. I know that from research online, this is the Topaz D202. But 
I know it went on here. It you know obviously, I mean the acrylic T and the regular alphabet English alphabet T look just about the same, I think, except here it's got what looks like an M, and so that's kind of confusing. And then here, I went to a Russian keyboard that I could type Russian characters so I could translate this and there's no G or U and um, on amongst the acrylic on there and so I'm wondering why is there a G and a U here I mean it, the best thing it comes out to be seems to be guckmophone instead of a dictaphone um, and then D202 of course if we turn the machine over if we if we look at the back of the recorder that actually does say dictaphone so I don't know what's with the G and the U at the top of the machine here it's got the acrylic equivalent of the D and I think this is acrylic equivalent of what would be pronounced with an I sound I, mean, I, I don't know Russian so forgive me for my uh, ignorance but um I believe that actually does say dictaphone and also you can see it shows the years 1985 one thing I absolutely love about old uh, Soviet electronics is they love to say the year almost always they put the year of manufacture and I am a kind of person that is kind of crazy about years I love knowing the year that things are from and that just makes me happy because too many items I have that you know Japanese recorders American recorders uh, German so forth recorders do not show the year I mean sometimes they do but more often they don't unless I can see a date code on a component inside a lot of times I can only estimate the year or find out through research online when the model came out. I love how a lot of Soviet, almost all the Soviet things I've seen show the year. So, anyway, enough rambling. I do that too often. That's why my videos are so lengthy a lot of times is because I just do a lot of constant chin wagging and literally wasting time. But, anyway. So, right here you have a power switch you can turn the machine on so this is one interesting thing about this because most recorders portable recorders it's turned on by pressing play you don't usually have a actual power switch this one does so one has to keep that in mind and there's a little red dot that shows so you know that it's on at a glance no indicator lights though except of course for an LED on the microphone when you play it doesn't do anything but when you record it will uh, flash according to the audio so so you have a switch there for power right here you have a switch that does two things it switches how loud it is during playback now you have a volume control regular volume control but it basically this switch is the maximum loudness um, of the playback I'm presumed probably switches the wattage of the amplifier, perhaps similar to the um, Vesna 306, but it also selects the sensitivity of recording. I think it's uh, analogous to a, dic a dictation and conference switch commonly seen on di dictation machines. You set it in the lower position, it's less sensitive and better for close range recording, and you set it to the upper setting, it's more sensitive and better for conference recording recording a group setting with various different people speaking um, this switch over here in this position is regular playback speed and in this position it plays slightly slower I think it would have been nicer in my opinion if they made it a two-speed recorder with you know the regular one and seven eights and then half speed switchable but instead it was just a half speed machine and then here's your eject what was happening before the eject the cassette got stuck the bottom of the actual wheel inside the cassette here 
this spoke caught against the top cover in the uh, on the spindle and it was catching and making it not want to go either up or down it was quite frustrating and okay so first time that happened too was of course on video of course then again i never just ejected close it ejected close it ejected close it over and over again until i showed it on the video um okay continuing the controls is rewind stop fast forward um of course if you start rewinding you can't go straight to fast forwarding you have to press stop first and that's simply by changing the polarity of the motor when it's in stop position all you have to do is energize the main motor and it will be re either rewind or fast forward depending on the polarity you energize another motor which operates a worm gear to move the head assembly up to the capstan or the heads and the pinchel are up to the capstan and then it will go into forward motion mode um, quite an interesting thing the way this recorder works this recorder I have footage of the inside that I'll be showing later that was shot earlier you'll you'll be amazed by how much circuitry this thing has it is very unusual when compared to your typical cassette recorder um, very interesting it is very lots of engineering in it it's got uh, both your analog audio but it also has digital logic TTL logic um, has a bunch of NAND gates in there TTL logic for the controls um, at the very front here the leftmost control is volume the middle control is tone and then the control on the right is very interesting this one here that's the rollback um, and you can adjust how long it rewinds for when you pulse this back it will activate a slower rewind for a couple seconds or so and you can adjust how long that little rewind operates with by adjusting this knob it's a very unique feature um, then you have a couple of DIN connectors which you'll have your line level output and you'll also have a input which is somewhere between line level and microphone level if you put a full line level source on it it will and record it will overdrive like mad if you put a microphone level source on it it'll be so weak you won't hear anything it's somewhere in between and unfortunately it does not cut off the hardwired microphone here so if you're recording through this din connector um, a direct source you're also going to pick up ambient noise from the microphone I don't know why they didn't provide a switch to turn the mic off or a interlock to turn it off when you plug in there but that's you know kind of a disappointment there in the design I don't know why they didn't make it where you could cut that off then again though this is meant as a dictation recorder they probably didn't really have it in mind as being something to record music with it's meant to you know for dictation and then I believe that the control I mean the not the jack on the right of it is I think it's for external power input but also I believe it's for external control of the um, transport mechanism as well you know for, so you could use stuff like a foot pedal or a remote start stop you know for like pick up a telephone and it will start the recorder or something like that so then again I'm thinking about the whole ambient noise thing if you record a telephone so whatever um, then you got a headphone jack down there which is not 3.5 millimeter nor is it half that size it is some size in between so I don't have any headphones that have the jack that's the same size um, it's some Russian size that I don't have but it's a headphone jack so I hit the microphone against the camera so now um, we're going to show this um, operate eject it put in a tape I have a chrome tape it will work with a chrome it will also work of course with normal bias is what's typical 
some reason I'm having issues with erasing on this one. I had to bulk erase this tape first because it had stuff on it that I didn't care about. And um, anyway, you can tell just by the amount of hiss and playback that it's equalized for the slow speed hiss from the amplifier, not the tape. Um, let's switch to a different mic setup real quick. I know it's great using a nice compressor and professional quality microphone and all that, but demonstrating I'm just going to use the camera's mics um, and automatic level controllers of, of a camera. So I'm going to make a recording. I'm going to move this downward like this. Now you can see the light on the microphone, the LED is flickering according to the sound. This is picking up at arm's length distance as I make this recording. Now I'm speaking up to the microphone and uh, to see how it comes out here. Now I'm going to switch the switch to the weaker sensitivity, that is the dictation sensitivity. I'm continuing to speak up to the microphone at this sensitivity. Now I'm going to go to arm's length again. The light is not flickering nearly as much because the sensitivity is less. Okay, let's stop the recording. And now we're going to rewind it and play it back. Same levels of subsidies. Like almost to the point where it's, in, where it's just it's just absurd. Um, like if you leveled the playing field, I really think that electric cars would be much further down the road than they are right now. Like this. Now you can see the light on the microphone, the LED is flickering according to the sound. This is picking up at arm's length distance as I make this recording. Now I'm speaking up to the microphone and um, to see how it comes out here. Now I want to switch the switch to the weaker sensitivity, that is the dictation sensitivity. I'm continuing to speak up to the microphone at this sensitivity. Now I'm going to go to arm's length again. The light is not flickering nearly as much because the sensitivity is less. Okay, let's stop the recording. If you hold down the stop key here, it will temporarily stop the tape's movement by turning the motor off. You can use it as a probably unintentional electrical pause. Now let's show the rollback feature. This is a quick message on the tape. Now let's roll that back and play it back. That was too quick. Let's go longer. This is a quick message on the tape. 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 Message on the tape. Jeez, it's a very quick rollback. It's a pretty cool feature, the rollback on this machine. I wish you could hold it to remind, make it rewind for longer, but it doesn't work that way. for longer but it doesn't work that way but it doesn't work that way anyway it can be so quick it doesn't, it doesn't even do anything way. to being a the longest is let's see it's a pretty cool feature that roll back on this machine we'll take Sensitivity, that is the dictation sensitivity. Pretty cool. 
pretty cool feature this recorder has. I mean a lot of recorders have, I mean, some dictation machines do have a similar feature, but it's interesting that this one has a pre-timed version that you can adjust the time for. Um, so you can pretty much do lots of things just from the microphone itself without touching the actual recorder. Now, when we turn the volume all the way down until it clicks, it switches the playback to this little speaker inside the mic. So, yes, I am getting text messages and it's kind of annoying. Okay, well, anyway, it's not that annoying. So, pretty cool. This recorder is AC bias and AC erase. Thank you very much. Now, this recorder, I'm going to be showing music recording now. Obviously, it picks up ambient sound from this. It's not perfect for music recording. It also, the bass is actually a lot stronger than I was expecting that is the bass in the recording. When I would make a recording on here I had a lot of bass distortion. I thought, oh my gosh, this thing sucks. Why why does it sound so bad? You know, I replaced all these caps, did this and that. And then I went to play those recordings on another recorder. And I was amazed. Not only was the bass not nearly as distorted as I thought, and in some case it wasn't really distorted at all, it just the bass was very strong and deep and full, lots of bass. It's just that when I try to play it back through the little speaker and little amplifier, the bass being as strong as it was and also recording very hot onto the tape when I played it back on the Marantz PMD-221, that meter was well into the saturation zone. It was, um, it's just that little amplifier and the little speaker, it just was clipping in those bass frequencies during playback because they were so strong in the recording. But let's do a music recording and let's show how this one goes with music. While I do the music recording, I'm going to try to dampen the microphone so it picks up less ambient noise. Yes, I am 29 years old and I still have teddy bears and I have absolutely no plans on ever getting rid of them.
So that was music recording on the machine. I had to do only trials and errors because it's easy to, it's so easy to overdrive the recording when I'm trying to do it and it distorts like crazy. The ALC on here does not work very well. Um, but, so I had to try these trials, keep adjusting the output level going into the machine, but once you get it set, it's all right. I want to see how it is with direct hookup, see if we can get any better playback of this. I'm now recording on the machine again. Voice recording. Okay, this is an arm's length distance recording. This is an up close recording. Conference mode, I would say. Now it's set to dictation mode. Speaking up close. Now we're speaking at arm's length. We're back to conference mode. I may have said conference mode when I'm in dictation mode. Who knows? Vraz Vadanya.
I'm now recording on the machine again. Voice recording. Okay, this is an arm's length distance recording. This is an up close recording. Conference mode, I would say. Now it's set to dictation mode. Speaking up close. Now we're speaking at arm's length. We're back to conference mode. I may have said conference mode when I'm in dictation mode. Who knows? Vrasvadanya. You can hear when I played back recordings from the Topaz D202 from the Marantz PMD221 Professional Recorder. You could see the actual level on the tape which was quite strong on some occasions and you could hear just how intense the bass was. An earlier portion I played on here was when I was doing various different tests with levels where you could see the level was stronger and the but the bass wasn't really that distorted but it was very intense but it sounds more distorted when played on the played back on the topaz One last types of, type of recording is we're going to do music again, except we're going to use the external microphone of the Topaz. And we're just going to put it up to a speaker. It tends to get more trouble that way. The biggest crime is in a bank. Call it just a money prank. But these men walking still free. Folks are calling misery. Appeared. Well, viewers, I hope you enjoyed this uh, recording or video of the Topaz D202 dictation recorder. Anyway, so, anyway, I mean, a couple more things about this recorder is, unfortunately, it's not erasing well. It's not the erase head being bad, though. The erase head's fine, and there is definitely an erase signal. And I have some cassettes. It will erase. Sometimes it does. Sometimes it won't. And other cassettes, it just doesn't want to erase at all. I think it's a taped, to con taped head contact issue, even though I cleaned the erase head. But, um, anyway, it's a very interesting recorder. 
Um, definitely, you got to be if you want to record music, you got to be very careful about your levels because it's very easy to overdrive it and distort it. But if you have your levels set just right, it will. Uh, that is your level coming into the recorder because there is not really much of level control in this thing. It will sound all right. Very interesting recorder. Frequency response is 250 hertz to 5 kilohertz. Though I would venture to say probably the frequency response goes lower than 250 hertz on recording. And then on playback, it probably goes down to 250 hertz. Because when I played the recordings back on this recorder directly, there wasn't nearly as much bass as extremity as when I played the recordings made on it back on the Marantz. So now some more video footage will be shot video footage I shot while I had the machine opened up when I was working on it I replaced a lot of capacitors matter of fact there was a one capacitor that was the incorrect value installed amazingly enough which caused the rollback not to work and then I had to add in a resistor as well to give at least some ALC to the thing I think it's supposed to have ALC it just wasn't quite ALCing right. Yeah, and anyway, this is an interesting recorder. It's very, very interestingly engineered with lots of field effects transistors being used as electronic switches. There's no formal record play switch in it. You know, the long switch you typically see in tape recorders to switch between play and record. The recording and playing switching is done by feeding a logic signal from the switch here logic gates and then sending to FETs turning parts of the circuit on parts of the circuit off it's very interesting how it's designed although I don't know why the automatic level control couldn't have been done a little better but it's quite interesting this recorder Hope you enjoyed this presentation shot by Ricky Klein, the Cassette Master. Today's date is the 15th of May, 2020 AD on the Gregorian calendar system. And um, very interesting recorder. I'll put a link to a, to a collector's website where they also have one of these recorders. It's a very, very cool website and I'm sorry again this video is not for all audiences and what I mean by that is the video is very long and I do a lot of chin wagging and I don't stop talking because when I'm making a video and I get into that kind of mood I just keep talking and talking and talking and here's the inside mechanism of the Topaz D202 cassette tape recorder from 1985 you gotta love the Soviet engineering in this thing. It's quite fascinating. You can see that the heads are at an angle, interestingly enough. When the machine is started, the, this motor here drives a belt, moving this worm gear, moving this gear here to pull the heads and pin troller up. Now, of course, this switch is normally always on whenever the machine is turned on and held down by this little mechanism over here, so I'm having to manually do it, so excuse me for me to stop it. i got to do this first and then do that to see it stop. Rewind. It's as simple as that. Stop. Fast forward. Rewind and fast forward simply change the polarity of the motor. And depending on the polarity, this little roller here, a little idler here, moves. You can see around the supply wheel, it has a um, looks almost like a gear. It's got little grooves in it. 
and it's got a little optical deal there. It's got a little infrared uh, LED and detector so that it can optically sense whenever the uh, supply reel is in motion. You cannot go straight between rewind and fast forward. You have to stop it first and then go to the other function. All those controls are done through digital TTL logic. Thank you very much. Quite the machine indeed, huh? Beautiful recorder this is. Very well designed. Soviet engineering. The machine has a backspace control, which again, I have to hold this when I operate it. So that's stop, play, backspace. It does a pre-timed backspace that is adjustable. It's called rollback. It'll just rewind for a moment and then go back. And it rewinds, I think, at a slower speed than regular. Out! Regular rewind. Yeah, it does. Rollback rewinds at a slower speed. Okay. And um, you can see down here on the amplifier chip, I put a heat sink. Because when I first got this, the amplifier chip was getting quite hot. And also, it. Uh, was drawing a lot more current than I was expecting. I searched the data sheet for this chip and found that it was uh, analogous to the TAA300, although the TAA300 I believe is in a TO18 or similar package, not a DIP package. But looking at a schematic for a 1 watt amplifier I found online using the TAA300, it talked about adjusting a particular pot to get a quiescent current of 8 milliamps and I thought well this being similar there must be a way I can get that current down so the resistor I saw in the same kind of place although a very different value was this one right here originally there was a 1 ohm resistor and I replaced it with a 4.7 ohm resistor and the current draw went way down way down it was drawing probably a good you know 300 milliamps or so just on standby and then the current went way down to where it's whenever it's on and it's not running it's drawing uh, what 80 70 or 80 milliamps for the whole recorder with the amplifier and standby it's a fascinating machine to see the inside of it's quite something to see soviet electronics there's something about soviet electronics that's just different from Japanese electronics and American electronics of its day and the Soviet stuff is just always fascinates me. On the schematic I found this capacitor right here. Interestingly enough it actually mentions it being 100 microfarad in the schematic and I just now noticed it. The capacitor that had been installed was only 30 microfarads and the delay was for the rollback was way, 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 way too short. I put a 220 microfarad capacitor in place of that, though I'm considering putting a 100 one and see if I can do good with a 100 microfarad. Noticing now that the schematic actually specifies a 100 microfarad, yet the recorder had a 30 microfarad installed instead. So they put the wrong cap in there. That's probably why the backspace wasn't working right. Here's the speaker. It was uh, having problems with its audio, it was like vibrating uh, around, like it was uh, rattling. 
I thought it might have been a rubbing voice coil, but I'm starting to think it because it's not rattling now. It might have been this this thing sitting against it, possibly. Our fuzzy sound on the speaker we had when the recorder was together was caused by the original foam here hitting against the cert the dust cap of the speaker as it was playing. So and I just put some red felt here in place to replace it and that took care of that. Here's the inside the back of the Soviet Russian recorder. Um, beautiful Soviet circuit board here. Just take that in. And then the mechanics, the back of the mechanics there, dual flywheels, mind you. Here is there, right there is that idler that sw sw swivels back and forth for rewind and fast forward. Then this white idler above it is for the clutch mechanism for the take up. And here is the underside of the circuit board. This red capacitor right there in the middle is a 100 microfarad capacitor that was the uh, one I replaced th to do the time delay for the rollback. Originally it was a 30 microfarad capacitor installed but the schematic showed a 100 microfarad capacitor. I may have mentioned putting a 220 microfarad because the schematic showed a 100 microfarad. I went ahead and put it back to 100 microfarad. And anyway, it's I replaced several capacitors, not all of them. Some of them are still okay. And then a number of them are like were really bad. So Yeah. Two things I want to show on the Soviet recorder was one is um, I'm able to run this off two eighteen six fifty lithium ion batteries in place of where the six double six C's would go. Um, so Basically, uh, this index card is just to help shield these springs from carving into the insulation on the 18650 and then shorting something out. This positive connector here, which goes down to that spring, um, I bent the metal out just a little bit bowed it out a little bit so it would push against the 18650's positive contact um, and to help hold the the other side in they just slid a piece of cardboard in there and then I got a small what's called a pico fuse it's just a little one amp fuse it looks like a resistor but it's a small one amp fuse from the negative and then that's just the pin of it just pushes against the battery and it works another thing I want to share is after uh, long time of messing around with this thing because I had noticed the automatic level control was not appearing to work at all on the recordings and it was overdriving very easily and it was annoying and I was like what on earth so I looked at the schematic first of all if you see the schematic you'll see there's a lamp going to a resistor so I thought uh-huh I've seen this type of scheme used in automatic level controlling in the past this has nothing to do with the ALC and is not used for automatic level control at all in this recorder. Automatic level control in operation is done through use of this P-channel FET. Basically you'll have a DC level of the audio signal appear at its gate. So normally you have your audio coming through here, it's amplified, and then directly goes to the base of this transistor, amplified, and goes into your op amp or your preamplifier and then so but and then you have this capacitor here such that this is electrolytic here it's like a 10 microfarad this one's only like I think 180 picofarad so very small but this one's like 10 microfarad or something so if, it, if this transistor is fully turned on what happens is this this capacitor is essentially shorted to ground all the audio is in AC coupled directly to ground and does not go to that transistor or at least whatever does go to that transistor is very weak so makes sense audio level here controls that transistor so I put a meter 
on this gate here and I'm getting a voltage corresponding to the audio. The louder I would talk through the microphone, the lower the voltage was. Being a P channel, the more if you ground this, if you ground the input, it'll turn it on. So basically you need a very, very, very low level. The lower the voltage is, or the closer it is to ground, the more this turns on, basically. So but the voltage was not decreasing enough to actually turn the transistor on. So the transistor was never actually turning on and never actually bringing this capacitor to ground to lower the recording level. So then I saw this resistor here which is a 220K on the schematic. The installed resistor on the actual recorder was around 117 or so K when I measured it on the, on the meter so it was apparently the wrong resistor was put in. It gave some cryptic number on there that didn't say anything according to the resistor value on the actual resistor itself so I can't say for sure whether the resistor has failed or that they just put the wrong one in there but considering they put the wrong rollback cap in there according to the schematic I wouldn't be surprised they put the wrong resistor in here too. When I put a 220k in there I got a tiny bit of ALC operation I mean, I would yell into the microphone if I had something in the background while I was recording as kind of a reference. And then I yelled in the microphone. I could notice the background sound once I was finished yelling. It was a little, little bit lower level than it would quickly go back up to full sensitivity. But it was very, 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 very slight ALC, hardly any at all. And it was still overdriving driving like mad. So it wasn't giving me much ALC. So I tried increasing this R45 value, um, increasing it to a very high resistor resistance, and that didn't seem to improve anything. And then finally, I made it into a voltage divider where I got another resistor from the gate to ground. I finally went, a, went upon putting a 1 mega ohm resistor here in place of the 220K and then getting a 680k ohm resistor from the gate to ground and that gave me that funny made that voltage a bit smaller on that gate where the ALC is operating a bit better now it's not perfect ie you can still if you if you if you yell into the mic it'll still overdrive but if you if you talk into the mic louder louder into the mic and then you talk quieter afterwards you'll notice that the level had been lowered and then it goes back up again because the LED flickers according to the audio so the ALC is working now I uh, basically I just had to put a 1 mega ohm resistor across from here to here on the other side of the board and then across the the uh, gate and the I believe that's going to be your drain here I uh, just bodged a 680k ohm resistor on the back so you notice the odd one out of the bunch when you look at the other side of the circuit board is you'll see in there is a, it's hard to see the um, actually where where it's there it is um, I'm sorry the camera and everything I looked at it with my eyes and oh, I can't find it on the there it is you'll see the one mega ohm color-coded resistor amongst all the Soviet resistors, kind of the odd one out. I also replaced a bunch more caps, went in with the ESR meter, started checking caps, found a few more that were completely leaky because of course I thought, and a few more that were a little bit leaky but not super leaky, because I thought, oh, well, maybe the ALC is not working because of a bad cap. Well, so I started replacing a bunch of caps and I replaced all the ones that were really bad and that didn't fix it and then I started troubleshooting with schematic and finding where the actual ALC controlling and the stuff with the resistors so finally with putting a 1 mega ohm there in place of the 220k and a 680k from the gate to ground that got the ALC to operate so kinda crazy that I had to add an extra component that was not there originally to get the something that should have already worked to work <laughs> this is a mini cassette 